Good morning and welcome. Usually I would just be able to sit here and talk off the cuff when introducing somebody, but with the accolades and uh, career achievements that Mr. Pillsbury had, I wanted to make sure I wrote it down so I remembered everything. Mr. Pillsbury joined Marriott Corporation in 1969. During his 20-year tenure at Marriott, he served in a variety of roles, including Hotel General Manager, Director of Sales and Marketing, and Strategic Planning and Development. In 1986, he was named a Corporate Officer and Executive Vice President of Marriott Corporation. From 1986 to 1989, he revamped Marriott's pricing strategies and developed the first generation of revenue management and yield management systems. He also had a hand in, um, in starting the Frequent Traveler Program for Marriott, Marriott Rewards. He launched venture teams that led Marriott's entry into the timesharing business, Fairfield Inns, Residence Inns, as Vice President and General Manager. He supervised 18,000 people and over $1 billion capital investment. Today, Mr. Pillsbury is the CEO and Chairman of Thayer Logic Group, which he founded in 1991. It is placed in the top 5% of all institutional real estate fund sponsors and recently announced the launch of its seventh institutional hotel real estate fund. He has played a major role in the launch of numerous new companies, including internet services provider TIG, Chinese Central Reservations innovator Hub S1, and Peer Rooms Company providing hypoallergenic guest rooms. Um, I, I know this man as my owner and somebody who has given us every resource possible to be successful here at the Miami Airport at the Sheridan. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Mr. Lee Pillsbury. So thank you everybody, uh, and it's great to be here with you this morning. I am so proud of what the team at this hotel has accomplished uh, this past year. Miami, of course, is a great hotel market, one of the best in the country, and uh, you have had a phenomenal 2012. You're off to a great start in 2013. But this hotel has just uh, really uh, risen to the top of our pile, thanks to the management team here. The uh, REPCAR index is up over 100%. Uh, 10 points in REPCAR index uh, gained year over year. Just terrific. Uh, really, terrific. So, uh, and, and that's really uh, what I want to talk about this morning. And uh, as, a, as a hotelman, as a general manager, Started as a as a soda jerk in Howard Johnson's, uh, and my wife likes to say that I don't deal with the soda anymore. <laughs> Thank you. But uh, you know, my whole career has been in, in our business, and the thing that I've learned at the end of the day, in order to be successful, uh, you've got to take customers out of your comp competing hotels. Uh, this is a it's a zero sum game just because you become general manager of this hotel doesn't mean anybody else is going to fly into Miami Airport. So the way you succeed uh, is to is to provide better service uh, and uh, and uh, attract more customers and ultimately charge a higher price. So uh, I learned that and in school, Ellsworth Milton Statler, who built one of the first chains of hotels in the United States, uh, started back in the early 1900s. Has a, had a very famous quote that's on the wall of the Cornell School of Hotel Administration who says, life is service. The one who succeeds is the one who gives his fellow man a little more, a little better service. So today I'm going to talk about uh, changes in competition, what's happening in our business, how it's impacting us in the hotel industry. But uh, think about it in the context of service. Think about it in the context of the value to the consumer, to the customer, to our guest. So, uh, the, what I'm going to uh, focus on is what I call disruptive innovation. And by that I mean uh, changing the status quo. So, disruptive innovation is the new punk rock. And we're in a mature business. Uh, it looks a lot like it did uh, when I first got in business back in the 1960s. And, uh, and you know, there's the, the, the beds, the telephones, the, the, it's a flat panel TV, but you know, it's TV, it was black and white then, but you know, now it's, you know, it's still, there's still TV. 
Uh, there's still a door and a door lock and, and all the basics, the front desk. Uh, we used to have paper folios, now we have computer CRT screens. Uh, we used to have uh, desk clerks who had their heads buried in the buckets of reservations. Now we have desk clerks with their heads buried in the CRTs. Uh, so uh, the industry really looks pretty similar to what it did uh, even 50 years ago. But the truth of the matter is that an enormous amount has changed. Uh, and an enormous amount has changed, not only in how we do things, but also um, how our guests do things. And so this is a little hard to read here, but uh, the takeaway here, how many of you know Red Bull? How many of you ever had a Red Bull? Yeah. So Red Bull was without a doubt the worst tasting crap I've ever had in my life. <laughs> It, if, if you've ever had one of them, it's highly unlikely, unlikely you've had a second, right? But here's a company that has, has disrupted the sports drink market, the energy drink, they created the energy drink market out of a product uh, that didn't exist. And a, a true example of, of disruption uh, in, the, in, the, in that uh, business. Similarly, bottled water. And it's hard to understand how uh, you can take a can of Coca-Cola take all the ingredients out of it and charge more for it than when you had all those ingredients in it. Okay. But that's bottled water. So uh, innovation is occurring in, in all over in business models. It's occurring in technology. Uh, uh, I, I made a uh, note here on mobile, which I want to talk more about. Uh, mobile is going to change your life. It's going to change the way you do business. And uh, travel and tourism has been, has been uh, impacted as well. So business models, if you think about Amazon, Amazon didn't, didn't invent any products. And in fact, all they do is sell somebody else's stuff. Right? But they found a new way to do it. Uh, they, one of the things that they have done uh, is one twig. Right? And how many of you buy things on Amazon? Right, so do you know it's the only company online that has one-click purchases? The only company. They have, they have managed to get a patent on one-click. So no other, no other online retailers can offer one-click purchasing. Amazing. Amazing. Dell, uh, what Dell did that made them so successful was customization. They enabled you to build a computer exactly to your specifications. Now, they got into the retail business and you started seeing Dells and Best Buys and other places, but the core of the business, what made them so successful, was the ability for you, the consumer, to have a customized computer that met exactly your requirements. And of course, eBay uh, has created the backyard garage sale. And, and uh, you know, my mother used to have eBay, right? Out the street on Saturday morning, right? With the card table, right? So in, in technology, I mean, we're, we're, all, we're all experiencing that. Uh, uh, how many of you read the newspaper every day, or most days? So personally, I have a subscription to three newspapers. And, um, and I really like getting my newspaper in the morning and turning the pages. But I gotta tell you, my nieces and nephews, none of them, none of them ever, ever touched the newspaper. It's all online. <coughs> the, way that, the way that they get and process information is completely different, completely different. Uh, and that's, and when I was uh, in marketing for Marriott, we used to uh, run ads in the Sunday travel section of the New York Times. How many of you even know that the New York Times has a travel section, right? And certainly our, uh, my nieces and nephews wouldn't know that. Right? So uh, the distribution channels, the marketing channels have all changed. And you see that tablet uh, up there. Uh, we're this close to making laptop computers obsolete. And when, within the next, certainly within the next five years, laptops are gone. Uh, just, there's no longer any reason to have them. So in our business, um, this is this is uh, a lot of information. But let me just uh, let me, since you can't see it, I'll read I'll read some of the highlights to you. 
Global tourism, one trillion dollars, one trillion dollars in 2011, uh, up almost two percent uh, in over 2010. Five percent growth per annum globally over the next five years. U.S. business track, 32 billion to 46 billion in the next five years, almost a 50 percent. China will emerge as the largest single country for outbound tourists. So uh, I do a lot of business in China. We've been there since 2004, during Iron China four, five times a year. Uh, we're partnered with a very large state owned enterprise in China that together we own interstate hotels and resorts. And uh, by the end of this decade, 100 million outbound Chinese travelers in. Uh, you better figure out how to say ni hao. Chinese, <laughs> um, and and uh, if you're in a city like Miami, you're already dealing with international travelers. You already have a strong appreciation for different cultures. Uh, but here comes here comes a, a tidal wave. In China itself, I think there's about two and a half million hotel rooms today in China. That compares to about 5.5 million in the United States. So 310 million people here. Five. Five and a half million hotel rooms, 1.3 billion over there, and about 2.5 million hotel rooms. Within the next decade, China will surpass the United States in many dimensions, one of which will be the number of hotels and the number of hotel rooms. And our partner over there, for example, launched a, a limited service hotel called Jinjang Inns that's basically $10 to $15 a night US, which is about 80, 85. Maybe a night. They built uh, 40 of them the first year that, that uh, I was working with them. Uh, and the second year, they built 300. They've been building 300 years. And, they just, and so, if you think about um, uh, growth opportunities, maybe learning Mandarin might be a good thing to do. Might be a good thing to do. So, uh, Global travel growth, this is, a, this is an industry that uh, never was global. When I entered this business, when I, in fact, when I got out of college, when I, when I got married, I didn't have a passport. You know, the closest I'd ever been to a foreign country was when my parents took me to Niagara Falls, right? And I looked across the falls at Canada, right? And then I married a Canadian and found out just how foreign it was. <laughs> Uh, but, but today, of course, our workforce is global, our guests are global, our co-workers are global, right? our owners are global, my partner's Chinese, uh, we have investors from, uh, from Qatar, Saudi Arabia, right? lenders, the, 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 the major lender to interstate hotels and resorts is ICBC, the International Construction Bank of China. Right, who made us a loan through Luxembourg. So it is very much of a global, global industry. And uh, it isn't, I don't think it's important that you know how to speak a foreign language, but I think it's critically important that you be able to understand and manage cross-culturally. And there's, there's, um, just, it, there, there's so much beyond just understanding a language. As I said, I don't speak Mandarin, I don't speak I don't know 25 words of, of Mandarin. It's a very, very difficult language, and I'm a slow learner. Um, but, and, and, but it's so easy, so easy to offend people. You know, you're sitting here with your legs crossed, showing me the sole of your foot. How dare you? Right? My God. And furthermore, you're, you're leaning back in your chair. You're not sitting up straight paying attention to me. Right? All these little subtle cultural uh, uh, Traditions, habits uh, become barriers. Whether you're dealing, whether you're dealing in Shanghai as I do, or whether you're dealing with Chinese uh, students at FIU. So, disruptive innovation all around. Again, hard to read the slides. I apologize for that. But we think about, uh, we think about the internet. We built the first website for a hotel, which uh, was in 1994 for the DoubleTree. Sunrise Boulevard in Fort Worth. 
It's the first website ever built for a hotel. And uh, three days later, we got a reservations request from some guy in Scandinavia. Right? I'm like, who would have thunk it? Right? And so I'm looking at this, at this request, and I'm, yeah, I'd like to come to Fort Lauderdale. This guy's in Scandinavia. And I said, there's something to this. You know, there's something to this. And so we ultimately built websites for all of our hotels. The, the organization that we put together to do that, we spun off in about 2000 to a company called TIG Global, and it's now owned by Micros, and it serves uh, a, a large number of hotels around the United States. Um, Google. And Google's now a verb. Right? <laughs> and, uh, it's now a verb for our sakes. So, in our business, what's, what's happening? Uh, digital data, the amount of information contained in computers is growing at over 60% a year. Over 60% a year. So the amount of information that if, if you have a teenager, a, a student in high school, the amount of information that that student gets in one year is more than his grandfather saw in his entire lifetime. Just stunning, stunning. Uh, mobile, uh, you know over 73% of the world population, 73% have a mobile device. We're talking six billion people. We're talking people in Africa. India, 73% of the entire world's population has a mobile device. If you aren't thinking about mobile in your marketing, you aren't thinking about mobile in your distribution, you aren't thinking about mobile in your operations applications. That's good. You're behind. You're behind. So, uh, smartphones, uh, 500 million smartphones are in use. 50% of smartphone owners have downloaded a travel app. 50% a travel app. Travel e-commerce grew 73% from 05 to 2010, $85 billion. And mobile e-commerce, $160 billion within just a few years. Uh, and I, the, the two graphs down here, big data and the cloud, uh, what we're talking about here, in the cloud is, is nothing more than software as a service. It's, it's, uh, it, it's how computing was done up until IBM invented uh, laptop computer, the desktop computer in the 1980s. Everything was, was done on central, uh, big central mainframes. Well, that's where it's going, it's going back there now. So, the first wave, again, things that, uh, that this is, these are countries down here across the bottom. Social media becoming more relevant for travel. Percent of respondents using social media travel related websites, right? The U.S. 60%, Canada 66%, Sweden and Denmark and the U.K. 77% utilization. Um, hotels, airlines are really trying to get rid of expense in the, the OTAs. We all, we all live with their burden. Um, and and honestly, I think it's very hard, very hard for a business to succeed when everybody in the value chain hates it. But Expedia has done very well, right? despite my distaste for it. <laughs> but I, but I think, I think uh, you know, I'm investing personally. We're investing as a company in trying to dislodge it, and and uh, hopefully for you will succeed. I want to talk about some specific innovative technologies we're using, trying to disrupt travel patterns, uh, trying to uh, move demand. Uh, and trying to increase preference. So Pure, which we're going to talk a little bit about, right? Yeah. Um, is a is a, an interesting one. Thirty-three percent of of people who travel in hotels say they have some sort of allergy, hay fever, or asthma. Huge, huge wow, in this country. Not not well understood. Not well. Not clearly focused on. But a third of travelers here with allergies and hay fever. As well. So, uh, what Pure has done is address that. And for those of you who have allergy or hay fever or asthma, 
Spending a night in your room is a life-changing experience. It is really remarkable the impact that it has. For those of us that don't have it, it's kind of hard to understand. I have the pure room technology in my bedroom, um, and I sleep much better, even though I don't suffer from allergy or any, any of that. Uh, but for people who do, it's, it's astounding the difference it makes. And uh, maybe you'll talk about the technology a little bit now and how it does that. But it's, it's uh, pretty remarkable. Thank you. Well, listen, thanks for taking the time to talk to me. I'm a proud Florida resident. I live up in Fort Lauderdale. Mary and I live up in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, and, and we travel all the time. My wife, who I didn't talk about this morning, I normally do, I'll just tell you uh, a couple things about her. Um, she is one of maybe a thousand women in the United States who are licensed and rated to fly jet planes. And um, you, ha you haven't lived until you've been doing a series of snap rolls in the backseat of her jet, her <laughs> military fighter jet, right? With her telling me to eat bananas before I go because they taste the same coming up as they do going down. <laughs> uh, so what, dis what distinguishes her though, and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop talking. What distinguishes her um, is her courage. She is, she is a, a huge coward. My wife is terrified. My wife goes through life shaking like a twenty dollar TV. Right? Every possible monster that can come out of the toilet, she's thought of. Right? And every time she gets in the airplane, right? Right? And she acts. You know, and, and courage, my definition of courage, is the is the willingness and the ability to act in the face of uncertainty, in the face of terror. Right? Face of fear. And uh, so, certainly the most courageous person I've ever known. So, anyway, thanks. I'm bowling. This is, this is a little white for a bowling ball. Actually, I, you know, I think this is for Mary now. Bowling? <laughs> Thank you, Wendy. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you.